Friends, there is constant sadness in the world, and the reason is not hard to find. Sin and death. Sin always makes us sad. Our own sins make us sad, and the sins of others make us sad when they touch our lives or the lives of those we love. And after man's fall from grace, this is an iron law of human nature. Because every form of slavery is sad and loathsome. And the Lord Jesus teaches us that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And death came into human life through sin. This relationship between sin and sadness is why we gave thanks a few moments ago in the collect or opening prayer of this Mass that God bestows eternal gladness on those he has rescued from slavery to sin. Today is the third of 13 consecutive Sundays on which the second lesson is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Please take time in the next 10 weeks to read and study all of that letter in your Bible at home. Two weeks ago, we read from chapter 5 of Romans about death coming into the world through sin, coming for all the sons and daughters of Adam because of the sin of our first parents. And we read, too, about Christ redeeming us from the grave by his victory over sin and death. Last week, we read from chapter 6 of Romans about the sacrament of holy baptism and how it plunges us into the death of Christ in order to unite us to the new life of the resurrection of Christ, freeing us from sin, making us the children of God by adoption. And now today, we read from chapter 8 of Romans about the ways in which we can cooperate with God's grace in the struggle against sin in our lives after baptism. But first we must recall that St. Paul understands the human person to be composed of three parts or dimensions, body, soul, and spirit. Our physical body is alive because of the soul or life force. And human beings share both a body and a soul or life force with all other animals. It is for Paul the spirit that comes directly from God and makes man alone of all the animals, a person created in the image and likeness of God and endowed with intellect and will. Next, we must take note that when St. Paul speaks of the flesh, as he does in today's reading, he does not mean the body. Paul knew that everything made by God is good, including the human body, or in Greek, soma. So when Paul uses the word flesh or sarx, he does not denigrate thereby the goodness of our bodies. He means, rather, that part of human nature is in rebellion against the love and law of God as a consequence of the fall from grace. And the part of us which is in rebellion, Paul calls the flesh. Because of the rebellion of the flesh, the desires of both the body and the spirit become unruly and require subduing, something that we cannot do without divine assistance. So today, Paul is addressing the Christians in Rome who have already been born again by water and the Holy Spirit in baptism when he writes, You are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit. If only the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, The one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you by holy baptism. Recall that before his ascension to the Father, 
Christ promised to send the Holy Spirit to teach and sanctify his church. And in the seven sacraments of the new covenant, we receive the grace of justification and sanctification by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And yet, at all times, even after baptism, we remain free to turn away from the Spirit by turning in on ourselves to every form of disordered self-love. And for that reason, we are always capable of rejecting the life of the new creation and of returning to the base condition of slaves by surrendering to our own disordered desires. And so, Paul warns the Roman Christians, whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Without discipline, no one can be a disciple. And among the essential disciplines of discipleship is the practice called mortification, which is what Paul describes here as putting to death the deeds of the body. Following the Lord Jesus in the way of the cross requires us to engage in spiritual combat, a life and death struggle with everything in us which is contrary to the gospel and then to cooperate with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to live for God in Christ Jesus. Such mortification or self-denial in turn requires us to trust the word of God more than we trust our own experience or wisdom. It requires us also to subject everything we think and feel, say and do to the judgment of divine revelation as the only sure measure of what is true and false, good and evil. Put most simply, after the fall from grace, we cannot trust ourselves until we have been freed from slavery to sin by grace through faith and have learned to live according to the Spirit dwelling within us. But how is this done? If the life of grace begins in us at holy baptism, then it continues to grow in us every time we go to confession. We prepare for confession by examining our lives in the light of the gospel to which we must submit ourselves in the obedience of faith. Then in the sacrament of penance, the grace of our baptism is renewed in us as we acknowledge our sins, and are reconciled to God and his church by absolution. And going to confession regularly is the best means we have of preparing to receive worthily the most holy Eucharist of Christ's body and blood as the medicine of immortality and food for the journey on the way of the cross. And that in turn is the way we live according to the spirit and put to death the works of the flesh. But here we must acknowledge that in our time, this Christian approach to living a good human life is held up to harsh ridicule by our culture, which exalts the imperial autonomous self as the only authentic path to the supposed liberty of self-realization. In this pagan view, any submission to a rule of life other than one's own desires is a form of oppression. But if the Lord Jesus is correct, then the refusal to surrender to the love and law of God is the very definition of slavery, the cruelest slavery of all, slavery to our own sins. And here we come to the oldest dispute in human history. The serpent promised our first parents that divine glory would be found in self-satisfaction and self-aggrandizement while the Lord Jesus reveals that divine glory is found in self-denial and self-sacrifice. The gospel today is taken from chapter 11 of St. Matthew, which opens with Christ praising John the Baptist as the greatest man of woman born, 
while also acknowledging that John was rejected and ridiculed by those who followed the wisdom of the world and would not hear or heed the word of God. Christ then warns all those who will not repent on hearing the truth of divine revelation of a coming judgment before explaining that knowledge of the true God comes finally from accepting divine revelation as a free gift. Chapter 11 then concludes with beautiful words of consolation and encouragement, words that can be a great help to us in our struggle to surrender to the gospel, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, and to live by the Spirit dwelling within us. The Lord Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My friends, in that easy yoke and light burden, we find the end of sadness and the beginning of holy joy in freedom from slavery to sin, the freedom of the children of God who are made a new creation through baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ.